Um, this morning we've got uh, in our plenary session uh, a real treat, Dr. Johnny Lake, who hails from Tennessee, and uh, he's a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Willamette University and has a Bachelor of Science degree in history as well. Um, he holds a master's degree uh, in uh, educational leadership from the University of Oregon, and his research has focused on uh, assessing student attitudes and providing a forum for students' perspective and voice. He serves as an advocate and a leader in improving academic outcomes for students of color and other marginalized groups. He served as an associate professor of education and counseling in the teacher and counselor preparation programs. He's an administrator on special assignment with the Eugene 4J School District and works with teachers and students to improve leadership, communication, and academic outcomes for all students. That last part sounds real familiar. He provides teacher training institutes along with student leadership in both the United States and Canada. He consults with a variety of agencies and organizations, including courts and justice systems, public service agencies, leadership groups, universities, mental health agencies, local and federal agencies, communities and churches. Almost makes me tired just to hear about all those folks that he's working with. <laughs> he's a writer, teacher, public speaker. He's a father and has raised four children. He's still very much a southerner, so I'm certain he'll appreciate our own brand of Puget Sound kindness and hospitality. Dr. Johnny Lake. Thank you. Uh, I'm grateful to be here um, more than most places. I go home a lot every year. It's been a practice of me and my children and my family to go home. In fact, my children call Tennessee home. None of them were born there. I got two granddaughters. They said, Papa, are we going home this year? And I thought, I said, baby, why y'all talking about home? They said, Tennessee. I said, you weren't born in Tennessee. I said, your parents weren't even born in Tennessee. I said, why do you call Tennessee home? They said, well, Papa, that's where all our cousins live. That's where there's a lot of people who look like us. And that's where you're from too, Papa. I said, that's a pretty good answer. A little bit later, they told me, they said, Papa, this time when we go home to Tennessee, we don't want to come back to Oregon. Now what is it that two little black girls get in Tennessee in a couple of weeks that they don't get for the rest of the year in Oregon? Don't forget that, because that still stays on my heart, that our children need to feel at home and that they don't. Do you know what happens in Tennessee? Are any of you Southerners? What happens to a little black girl when she go home? What they say about her hair? Ooh, baby, look at that hair. Come here, let me see it. They got to get all in it and everything. Look, look how pretty and black you are. You look just like so-and-so. And they got models, historical models, and they are loved and cherished. And so I tell teachers here in the Northwest, it's not a crime of commission. It's not something you are doing to these children. It's crime of omission. It's something you are not doing for them. And that needs to change. Um, do you think they ever asked me in Tennessee to make a speech? Do you think my folks want me to make a speech? <laughs> they don't want me to make a speech. I don't care who I'm talking to. I can be the most famous speech maker in the country. When you go home, they don't want no speech. Sit down and talk. Talk for real. And that's what I felt like coming here. That's why I was so excited that I was invited to come here. Because to me, this is not a speech. And I hope that you know it's not a speech. We are people of call and response. How many people know that whole philosophy? We are people of call and response. And that's what we should engage in when it comes to educating our children. There should never be anybody who comes and standing in front of the room and tell you that they got something to offer you and you don't get it. So if you got questions, raise your hand. If you agree, raise your hand. If you disagree, raise your hand and make it real. Our children need that, they deserve that. 
This is not a new conversation. This book, and books are important in our culture, because you could get killed for reading one of these in our history. You could get killed for having a book. Some of our little children struggle. What, 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 what's so dangerous about a book, Dr. Lake? But they would. This book I found in the garbage can at the school. It was thrown away from the library. It was thrown away. You look in it, it's discarded. This is I Am the Darker Brother, Anthology of Modern Poems by Negro Americans, and it was thrown away in the trash. And it is a book that travels with me everywhere I go, along with W.B. Du Bois. Paul Lance Dunbar says, we wear the mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile and mild with mirrored subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we We smile, but, O oh, great Christ, our cries, to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is vile, beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. I tell people, go find the oldest black person you know, the oldest black person you know, and ask them, how long have white policemen been shooting down black men in the street? What do you think you're going to hear? Forever. Ever since I was this big, one old black man told me. I said, how long have black churches been getting burnt down, and they just can't seem to figure out why or who's doing it, as long as I've been alive? So are these issues new that we look, see in this society right now? Is the challenge new? Do we have models? Yes, we have models. We have people who struggle and survive through slavery, Jim Crow, lynching. All of the history of this country is racism. Our people have been at the brunt of it. And from that process, we have become stronger. That's what I want you to think about. There are assets in the African American community. When I said reclaiming African American cultural values, I'm not exaggerating. They are there. They just don't look like dominant culture values. And in many cases, we are seen as deficit because our cultures don't look like dominant culture. This culture developed over time, not by choice, but by necessity. We had to stick together to survive. The relationship between black men and black women have always been an equal one, or guess who was the head of the household? In my family, guess who's the powerful person? Guess who I went to when I had to talk about money for my education? Grandma, guess who I went to when I wanted to get a car, and I already had my money, had to found the car, and everything else? Did I go talk to daddy? No, mama, would you talk to daddy for me <laughs> and tell him to let me get this car? If I asked dad if I could go to the movie, daddy, can I go to the movie? Guess what he said? Go ask your mama, whatever she says. <laughs> so if you think of the model of our families, they are matriarchal families. And this is not an accident either, because this is the root of African culture. The mother is at the center of the family, not the father, even though the father is there. I had a strong father, hard worker, whooped my behind but the boys were closer to the mother. Um, this is John Dewey, who's considered the father of American education. And I wanted you to get a few of his thoughts about what he thought about education. He says, social movement for change involve conflicts which are reflected intellectually in what? Controversies. It is the business of an intelligent theory of education to ascertain the causes for the conflicts that exist. Next point. Then, instead of taking one side or the other to indicate a plan of operations proceeding from a level deeper and more inclusive than is represented in by the practices and ideas of the contending parties. So you look at the whole situation. An arena of struggles, practical and theoretical, in the important social interests of education is what? So this debate is healthy. And we should be full participants in this conversation about what's happening to our children. In the African concept, 
the greeting is often, how are the children? That's an actual greeting in African culture. How are the children? Because if the children are fine, then guess what? Everybody else is fine. And when we look at the data for our children, we can't say that everything's fine. In every school district in this country, our children are typically at the bottom. Means the necessity of the introduction of what? A new order of conceptions leading to what? New modes of practice. <clears throat> I teach this in the classroom. I'm in the classroom. I'm teaching administrators for administrator licensure. Young white man raises his hand. Dr. Lake, I didn't grow up around black people. I grew up in Cresswell, Oregon. I only met black people when I was a grown man. So I would ask you to be patient with me because it takes time to learn how to work with black kids. I said, that's a pretty good point. I said, how many of you people in the classroom agree with him? Guess how many hands went up? <laughs> Every single one of them. I said, well, let me tell you my side of this conversation. I says, I'm an old man now. And I'm still sitting in rooms like this, listening to people like this young man say it takes time for us to get ready to teach black kids. I said, these were the same excuses I heard when I was a little boy. I says, I'm going to be dead soon. And I'm still sitting in rooms listening to people make these excuses that it takes time for us to get ready to teach black kids. I says, I don't, I don't got that kind of patience. I don't know if anybody else in this room got that kind of patience. I don't want to wait my whole life for you to get ready to teach black kids. Mm -mm. And we don't need to have that kind of patience. The expectation of a teacher is that you teach children. Who are our systems most successful with? The kids who match the culture of the school. I call it a cultural match. And if you think about this, remember this. This is a concept. When you look at a school, they are most successful with the children who most match the culture of the school. Do you know schools have a culture? Yeah. Schools have a culture. Who are they least successful with? Cultural mismatch. Now, when you see these conflicts going on in schools, many times they are associated with this kind of conflict. So that our children are loud, right? In typical household, how many people talk at the same time? Everybody. I took people to my house who were dominant culture. They said, how do you guys talk to each other? So everybody talks at the same time. I said, you listen to whoever you want to listen to. Well, how do you get in the conversation? Well, you wait till they take a breath and you get in there. <laughs> and there's science behind this in terms of communication styles. And it's really interesting because the model they use for our communication style looks like a musical note. All these voices interweaved with each other. Dominant culture, straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line. That is not even a conversation. And so our communication styles for our children will get them in trouble in a typical school, a classroom. You guys are too loud or you were disrespectful because he was talking and you started talking. That's normal. But now you got a behavior problem. And so these discipline issues you see oftentimes are often related to the cultural conflict going on in our schools. When we think about a school, we often think of it as a neutral place. But how soon does a poor child walking into a typical school figure out that this school was not constructed for them or for families like theirs? How long does it take them? First day. For the typical kid of color walking into our typical schools here, how long does it take that child to figure out that this school was not constructed for kids like them or for families like theirs? So there you have the cultural conflict starting immediately. The day you walk in school, you are in cultural conflict with the school culture, trying to be legitimate to yourself at the same time as be successful in school. And this is where the acting white concepts always come from, is that you got to change your behavior in order to be successful at school. And how many people know kids who don't want to do that? So what happens to them in school? They're in trouble all the time. Dr. Lake, they just don't like us around here. 
That's the best explanation I get from a kid. They can't even name exactly what's happening. But they just don't like us around here, Dr. Lake. And so if we think of it as a cultural conflict, then we can have an informed conversation with the system about being, instead of a monocultural system, being what? A multicultural system, which means they should embrace who? All of these children. And typical classroom, you will have a multicultural classroom. You guys know this. We have a very diverse community. But in terms of teachers and administration, you don't. So again, at the systems level, we have a challenge. Next slide. <clears throat> My papa, Nels Lake, was an old man when I was a little boy. My chore was to go take in wood for him every day. And down south, you do your chores. So every day, it'd be dark. I'd go down to the wood house and get wood and take it in the house for my papa. I never saw him standing up because he was bedridden. My papa went to second grade. This is the census report from 1910. If you look over further, where it says no and no and yes and yes, that question was can you read and can you write? And that stayed on my heart ever since I found that. My papa, at 24 years old, had to answer that question. No, I cannot read. I cannot write. And my father told me he used to sign his name with the X. But my papa was a tall man like you guys. Tall man that used to carry sharpened pencils in his pockets all the time that he would give to his grandkids. And what would he tell them? Work hard at school. This is a man who had a second grade. Work hard at school. The second person there, my grandma, went to fourth grade. That's all they afforded a black woman at that time. She's the one that told me, baby, you're a pretty little black boy. She said, well, all my grandbabies were black as you are. And she said, you're so smart. She said, study hard. You can make a smart man one day. And she said, you got pretty teeth. She said, brush them so you can keep them. <laughs> She's a practical old woman, too. She said, baby, if you need anything for your schooling, she said, come and see me. If your daddy won't do it for you, she said, come and see me. Now, I don't know how short people are in this room, but my grandma was 4'11". Used to wear these long dresses with pants underneath, because that's where she kept all her stuff was in them pants pockets. <laughs> My grandma was a real farmer. She had 135 acres of land. She farmed for real. And I go see her. I said, Grandma, I need some money for a field trip or a workbook or a special class at school. And she'd heist that dress <laughs> so she could get in them pockets. And she'd go in that pocket, and she'd come out with a handkerchief. And I can still see her fingers getting that handkerchief loose and come out with dollars that she had folded up and put in that handkerchief. Sometimes she'd have to heist the dress and get a different handkerchief <laughs> and have quarters all stacked up in that handkerchief. And she put that money in my little hand. So when I went to school, guess what kind of student I was? Because of who? Because of my grandma. I got A's and grades all the time. I got F's in conduct a lot. But I got A's and grades all the way through. That's how I ended up Phi Beta Kappa. Everybody was surprised that a black man was that smart. But it goes back to this woman. My father went to eighth grade in broken segregated schools. I spent my first four years in those same broken segregated schools. This is how far we are away from that second class education that our families, our communities were delivered. And during this time, nobody talked about an achievement gap. You know that? Nobody talked about an achievement gap. My auntie, 96 years old in California, I've been interviewing her. I said, auntie, I said, how are the schools? She says, baby, the white folks didn't give us no money for no schools. I said, what y'all do for schools, auntie? She said, we put our little money together, and we hired us a teacher, and they came in, and they taught our kids. I said, what about books? She said, books? She didn't give us no books either. I said, what'd y'all do for books, auntie? She said, the white school would throw away their books, discard books, same as this book. And she says, the shoe man would collect the books and take them to the shoe store. And she said, we used to go down to the shoe store and buy books for our kids. And I said, what about voting, auntie? She asked surprise again. She said, voting? She said, didn't know black people even try to vote back then. And so for the young people, I want you to realize when you go to vote, 
that it's been paid for. It's been earned by the people who came before you who had no opportunity but had to risk their lives for us to stand here and have the opportunity to go to school, opportunity to have books, opportunity to vote. Next slide. <clears throat> this was on the wall in my grandma's house when I was a little boy. I didn't even know what it was. But my grandma said, baby, in this life, she said, everybody always wants to start in the big end of the horn. She says, but if you are smart, she says, always be willing to start in the little end. She said, because if you start in the big end, she'd run her finger all the way around. She said, where do you think you're likely to end up? But she says, if you are willing to start in the little end, she says, where do you think you're likely to end up? That's old black wisdom lesson. Always be humble. Always be willing to start at the little end, because then you are most likely to end up at the big end. Next slide. The illiterate of the 21st century. Literacy, we typically think of it as reading and writing. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those people who cannot read and write. It will be those people who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Take this one with you, too. Because this is really a process that everybody in education needs to commit themselves to, is to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Which one do you think is hardest? Learn, unlearn. How many people think unlearn is hardest? Relearn. Everybody always mislearn. How do you know what you know? If you grew up in a racist household, in a racist town, in a racist community, do you walk around thinking, I'm racist, I'm racist, I'm racist? You don't even know what you've learned. We come in this world a blank slate. And so many of these issues that come up in our schools, they come up with people who, that's why they call it unconscious bias or implicit bias. Because these people have grown up in a way that, guess what? They see the world through a certain lens and they themselves don't even realize it. And they make all kinds of excuses for it, which is what you see with the failure for kids of color in our schools. We got many, many excuses. It's important to think about what we say and what we do. Because when there's a difference between what we say and what we do, which one do we typically believe? What we do. In fact, it's true for our children as well, so that we can say we're really nice, but there's an interaction we have with our children that supersedes what we say. So the actual behavior is what our kids respond to. So the teachers can say, oh, I value education, I value diversity, I value kids of color, you know, I really believe you can learn, and all of that, but if the actions don't follow, what do the kids take away? What we see our kids taking away from these educational processes right now. Exactly, is that they're not smart. So this distinction, we wanna make sure we hold people accountable. We got uh, the best rules in the world about education. You can pull the policies and all the policies are great. But in practice, there's a, always a problem. We wanna hold people accountable for that. Next slide. This last one is the, the last quote up there is the one I use with kids. When you wanna learn as badly as you wanna breathe, then and only then will you become wise. How bad do you want to breathe? When I ask kids, I say, if I cover up your breath and I take your breath, what you gonna do? They say, fight. What you gonna fight with? My hands, my feet, anything. I'll bite you, anything else. So if something is preventing you from learning, what should you do? Fight. Fight with what? Everything you got. So this is a good lesson for kids. Next slide. This is a learning model I demonstrate for teachers to have them think about doing a lot of talking does not necessarily teach a lot. But what do we do in universities all the time? Lecture, lecture, lecture. If you read something, which you got reading, you get 10%. If you got this little nice PowerPoint, you get 20%. Anybody happy with that? You get 20%. Discussion group, you get 50%. Practice by doing, you get 75%. Teach others, immediate use of your learning, you get 90%. So I'm gonna give you an assignment. You know, professors have to give assignments. That's the only way they feel like they're doing their job. So I want you to write your name. How you'd like to be addressed in this room today. You can use real name. You can use a nickname. You can even make up a name. You can be Wonder Woman or Superman.
Anybody have any trouble with that? At this point in our life, we usually don't have any trouble writing our name, but you are not born writing your name. It is a habit learned over time. In fact, when you were about three, your mom says, baby, can you write your name? No, mom, I can't write my name. I'm too little. I'm going to get you a tablet then and a pencil. Got you a big tablet about this big. Pencil look like a tree. And you work on that name. You get done. Mom, did I get it right? No, baby, you left a letter out. Dang. Try it again. Go back. You left a different letter out. Dang. Try it again. You practice all morning. You finally get it right. How do you feel when you learn that name? Oh, my goodness. You go tell your friends. I can write my name. You go tell your grandpa. I can write my name. And where do you write that name at? Everywhere you can reach. On the back of your door in your bedroom. Guess what's on your door? <laughs> that name. About tall as you are. But I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to challenge you a little more. I want you to write that same name again. Right underneath, out to the side. But I want you to be very careful. Because I want you to make it look identical to the way you did it the first time. Only this time, the pen or pencil goes in the other hand. Goes in the other hand. Now pay attention to what happens to you physically, psychologically, and emotionally when I ask you to do what? Change a habit. I want you to use this when you think about changing the systems of education that we are working with. Did you really want to do it this way? You'd rather put that pen back in the other hand, wouldn't you? Which is what we are asking teachers and administrators to do, is change their approach to how they deal with children of color, how they deal with children who are poor, how they deal with children who, who may have special needs. And so are they really going to want to do it? How many people did really good? You're really satisfied with your second piece of work. Let me see your hands. Take a look around the room. We got one, two, maybe three people who satisfied. So, so when people who are not competent in these areas are actually asked to change, they're not going to be good at it. And they're not going to want to do it. But if you do this long enough with this hand, guess what happens? You become one of those people that ruin this whole exercise. People who can actually write with both hands. Next slide. Education is emotional labor. How many people have ever done manual labor? Is it hard? At the end of the day, you got to go home and get some food and rest, take a bath, go to bed, do it again the next day. Intellectual labor. How many people have ever done intellectual labor? Is it hard? Stay up all night and write a paper, you got to go take a nap. How many people ever heard of emotional labor? And take a look around the room again. How many people ever even heard the term emotional labor? Working with people is emotional labor. Education is emotional labor. You have to give some of yourself to be able to be successful. When a child succeeds, what happens to our spirit? Goes through the roof. You can't wait to go tell somebody. When the child fails, guess what happens? You go in the ditch with them, even if you don't want to. You still go in the ditch with them. So pay attention to what we give and also how you restore yourself and how you stay motivated and how you stay positive to continue to do this hard, hard work. Next slide. If it's important to you, you will find a way. If not, we find excuses, which is what we hear a lot of. The color of your face should not determine whether you can teach a child. Next slide. This is what you just participated in was a change activity. Next slide. Implementing organizational change. This is what we go through in school. is change after change after change after change and never seem to get it right. Always, OK, let's try it again. Next year, they have another initiative. Next year, they have another initiative. Next year, they have another initiative. You've got so many initiatives, you don't even know which one you're working on at the time. And this is what education goes through. Next slide. Here's a simple process for change. And this one you can apply to these conversations you have with our educational institutions as well. It is so simple that it's scary. 
But guess which one is the hardest to get to? Mm-mm. State Department of Education. We never did get past what? We never did get past honesty. Because if we can't get honesty, we can't do the rest of it. And it's so hard to get an honest conversation about what's happening in education. So we need to press for honesty. When we get the data and it shows all of the outcomes and things like that, you can predict the data. I got some data in here. You guys already know what it says, right? I don't even have to review it with you. You know what it says. But we cannot get an honest conversation about what is going on. Empathy is difficult. But once we can get people engaged in what is actually happening honestly, empathy is pretty natural for human beings. Advocacy is one that we have to nurture because we have to challenge not just individual behaviors, but we have to challenge institutional behaviors. We have to challenge systemic issues that if you go in a school and you remove all the teachers, remove all the administrators, even get rid of the janitor and all the women in the cafeteria, and you replace them next week with all the people who came through the same institutions that those people came from, when the bell rings at 8 o'clock tomorrow, do you have anything different? Same old, same old. This is why advocacy is so important inside these systems, because the systems tend to reproduce themselves. And reproduction theory says that the systems are doing exactly what they were designed to do, which is reproduce the failure of certain people and the success of certain people. So to change systems, it takes advocacy, but don't do advocacy by yourself. That's like the little cricket jumping in front of the lawnmower and say, stop. Boop, that's it. All they found of you was a little leg left. And you've seen this happen. You've seen this happen institutionally. When a person, and I don't care what color they are, if a white person stands up and directly challenges the system, they usually don't last. And people puzzle, why would that person even do that? And so this is a very important place. And then actions follows advocacy, because if you are an advocate, you will take some action. You cannot sit on your behind if you are an advocate. And when we see what's happening to our children, I know I see a lot of people in here who are advocates. It means we do something. You don't sit back with the knowledge and information and don't be engaged and do something. My take would be that this process for change is not linear, that it's cyclical. Can you? say some comments about revisiting the process at various points? In order to become diverse and inclusive, we need to connect the dots to see the important connections. And this is somewhat related to your question as well. These are not, every school is different. Every community is different. So there's no prescription. Anybody shows up and tells you they got the prescription, kick them out of the room. There's no prescription. Every hat does not fit every head. This is one of the analogies I teach my students, and it's a good one. I got a hat. It's the education hat. It's an old hat, and it's a good hat, and we kept it in pretty good shape, and I use it on my students, and I try it on. Oh, my goodness, you are really a good student. The hat fits you perfect. Try it on another student. Uh, uh, turn your head that way. Uh, uh, turn it backwards. Uh, uh. It don't fit. I think you need a new head. <laughs> And this is a meaningful analogy if you think of it, because this is what happens with the testing. This is what happens with the educational model that we use. When a kid fits the model, we think they're smart. If they don't fit the model, something's wrong with the kid. Instead, what might I need? I might need a different hat. In fact, for the typical classroom, how many hats might I need if I'm really an effective teacher? I might have hats all around my wall, all around like this. And it's the expert teacher who figures out which hat is the right hat to use on the right day. Because the one that worked for this person yesterday, it don't work today. And I need to be the teacher who can figure out, well, wait a minute, that's not the hat to use with this student today. Do you see why it's a challenge to be a multicultural educator in the context of our typical classroom and school? And the pressure is not on the kids. The pressure is on who? Pressure is on the teacher. And so if we think of approaching these issues, each school is going to be different. And then go to the next slide. I created this for the Oregon Department of Education. <clears throat> and the fact that this is a cycle. It's not linear. That was a great point. Thank you, Kevin. Because it's not linear, it means that you develop a policy to address an issue. Say the achievement gap. You got a policy. Has it been effective? 
You put it into play, you come back, put it into practice. If it's not effective, where do you go? Back to that policy. The policy is not working well. We need to change the policy. And this is an ongoing process that has to take into account all the multiple factors that go into education. And it's really complex. Next slide. This is a grid that I use that helps actually make a plan for change. And it gives you the components for change. And it puts them in a dynamic uh, sequence so that when you do not have one of these resources or one of these components, you don't get change. And so if you take the top model, if you have vision skills, incentives, resources, and an action plan, you're likely to get change. So you can actually do an action plan based on these components and critically consider, do we have a vision? Do we have the skills? Do we have the incentives? Do we have the resources? And do we have an action plan? So you sit down with your team and you do a plan based on this, and you are most likely to get to effective change. Next slide. Education, go ahead. Education, root word, means to lead out of ignorance. But Paulo Fierde says there's no neutral educational process. He means there's no middle of the road. Education either teaches you about the system you live in and how to conform to it, or it teaches you to think creatively and to participate in transformation of the world. For you young people, is, which one is your education doing? Two choices. Education is teaching you about the system you live in and how to fit in and how to conform to it, or it teaches you to think critically and creatively and help to change the world. Raise your hand if your education is teaching you about the system you live in and how to fit into it. Raise your hand if you think that's what's happening. How many people think your education is teaching you to think critically and creatively and to change the world? Hands up. And there's always a few crazy people in the room who have had educators who have pushed them to do what? To challenge the system, to participate in the change, that's the conversation we were having when I first got in here this morning. How do we help our children to be active, critical participants in their own education? Because it does belong to them. As much as we got a lot of people who make money off education and we got politicians who swear they support education, truly at the end of the day, this is about the children's education. Not even about their parents' education. Not even about the teachers' education. It's about the children. Next slide. This is one I use to put a hook in everybody. Because who's responsible for academic achievement in school? Success and failure in academic achievement can be seen as outcomes and collaborative results of the actions of school systems, communities, teachers, students, and families. Who's off the hook? Nobody. This is why collaboration is really important in these systems. Next slide. There are an array of factors, and you have a lot of people involved in education who know little about education. Politicians, business people, people who are there to make money. They're pushing, pushing, pushing on education in certain ways that actually benefits who? The money makers and not the children. And we have to be careful of this. Next slide. Good Lad is a researcher here in the state of Washington, actually one of the most recognized researchers that does huge uh, data sets. Good Lad says that there's an array of factors, and William Jul Julius Wilson calls it a concentration of factors that account for the academic success or failure of a child. So you can have five factors that's impacting the child, and you can rush in there with all of your people and everything, and you knock off three. What you still got? You've got two factors that can account for the failure of a child. You work really, really, really hard, and you get rid of four. What you still got? You got one issue. It's a little bitty issue, too. You know, it's the littlest one. But it can still account for what? For the failure of a child. And this is why it's a comprehensive look we have to make at schools and education. Because we think that, well, you guys heard this. 
Um, I surveyed kids. I actually put it in the PowerPoint. What do you need to help improve your academic performance at school? Kids always say, we need more teachers of color and administrators of color. How many people heard that one? More teachers of color, more administrators of color. If you ever hear that from kids, always ask them one more question. It's a one word question. Ask them why. Ask the kids why, and you get some most interesting responses. The kids say, well, Dr. Lake, they'll know how it is for kids of color at school. Or they'll understand what happens to me at school. Or they'll know what my life is like outside of school. Or they'll speak up for me when things come up at school. Or they'll support me when I need help. Now, what does any of this have to do with the color of face? Zero. You got a hand up, baby? No. Zero. And this is where I teach my students the color of your face should not determine whether you can educate a child or affirm a child or support a child or care about a child. And this is where I think many dominant culture people are challenged because it asks them to get out of their comfort zone, to interact with a culture different than their own in a way that they may not be used to interacting. But if you're going to dare to enter a multicultural classroom, you better be counting on becoming a multicultural teacher. Because they're going to come to you the first day as a challenge. When you look at school as an ecological model, which is looking at all the different components that are at play at the same time, we can actually target many of the issues that children face instead of looking at the child as the problem. Next slide. Learning to read by Malcolm X. I'll refer that to anybody who hadn't read that little article that Malcolm X wrote about how he learned to read. He was the number one student in his middle school until his teacher told him that a black man could not be a lawyer. And he ended up dropping out of school. He went to prison. And Malcolm, he wrote an essay. He titled it A Homemade Education. Malcolm had dropped out of school in the eighth grade. Malcolm came to learn more by teaching himself than by rely relying on others to educate him. But that last point is what stayed with me. Malcolm said he never felt more free than when he was in prison and had access to books and learning. I think Washington is constructed a lot like Oregon. I go in the prison systems and I go work with the young men in the prison systems. I do the graduating speech for the young men when they get their high school diploma inside the joint. The largest group of black men I've ever sat with in the whole state of Oregon is where? Inside the prison. And most of them are younger men. They're not old men. Most of them are younger men. And they cry when they get their diploma. And they hug me, big old bear men, hug me and thank me for coming. If he gets out of prison, he's going out in a community where he's 24 years old, black man, with a high school diploma and a felony. Where's he going? These are the outcomes of educational failure. The most common characteristics of people who end up in our prison, and this is black men as well as everybody else, is that they failed in their education. So the best anti-prison measure is what? Good education. The best anti-gang measure is what? Good education. The best anti-poverty measure is what? Good education. This is why education is critical. You save lives in education. I guarantee you. <clears throat> I identified with Malcolm because I wrote an article about the police. They made a raid at the house next to mine, and I almost got shot. So I wrote a newspaper article about it. Everybody in the community heard about it. So the next time I went to prison to see all the guys, it was over a peanut butter sandwich that I had made. I walked in, all these men, and somebody brought me a peanut butter sandwich on a plate, one brother. And he says, don't worry about nothing. He said, the other brother's bringing you some milk. He's walking around the other side. But in that moment, inside the joint, they taken my ID, taken all my money, they put a little mark on my hand that distinguished me from all these other brothers in there. And I realized what Malcolm said was true. I felt safer inside the prison locked up with all these black men than I felt when I'm out on the street driving my car and the police get behind me. Is that ironic? 
that in this American society where they say freedom is something we all deserve, I feel more free in the joint with these brothers, feel more safe with these brothers than I do out on the street where they tell me I'm free. Next slide. Malcolm has a great analogy too, and this you see in your schools here as I looked up data, and you see it in the schools in Oregon, you see it in the schools in every state. When you live in a poor neighborhood, you're living in an area where you're gonna have poor schools. When you have poor schools, you have poor teachers. When you have poor teachers, you get a poor education. You get a poor education, you're only gonna be able to get a poor paying job. You get a poor paying job, it's only gonna allow you to live where? Back in the poor neighborhood. He calls it, what kind of cycle? A vicious cycle. How many people have observed this cycle all of your life in education? A vicious cycle. It's not an accident. It's a vicious cycle of a society like ours. Next slide. <clears throat> Pedro Noguera, if you haven't heard of him, you should look him up as well. Brilliant educator. He's a nightmare for um, many school systems because he speaks really honest. And I asked him, I said, Pedro, how can you come here and talk like that and they don't kick you? When I talk like that, they always kick me. He said, the difference is a plane ticket, brother. <laughs> he said, if they fly you in, he said, they know they're going to fly you out. So being at home in these conversations is really important, holding each other accountable. He says, I fundamentally believe that educating all children, even those who are poor and non-white, is an achievable goal if we what? If we truly value our children. Of course, that is the real question. Does American society truly value all of its children? I put a couple of reflections for you to have a conversation at your table there. First question, does an educator's racial and cultural background help or hinder them? And the second question, what skills, knowledge, or information do you think educators need to increase effectiveness as a teacher or administrator for all children? This is uh, graduation rates in the United States. As I said, you guys probably know this information. How are the black boys doing in the state of Washington? Not good. In fact, they at the bottom. Uh, let's go to Oregon, where I come from. How do you think the black boy is doing in Oregon? Not good. Let's go to uh, Denver, Colorado. How the black boy is doing in Denver? Let's go to Chicago. Chicago, how the black boy is doing in Chicago? They got to be doing good in Chicago. Uh, Washington, D.C., how the black boys? Uh, Boston, Massachusetts, they got Harvard. They got great education there. How the black boys in Boston? Um, North Carolina, they got great educational institutions in North Carolina. How do black boys do in North Carolina? Let's go to Florida. Florida, back there in Florida. The black boys do great in Florida, right? Oh my goodness. Let's go to Alabama, heart of the civil rights movement. They got to have great education. Tennessee, where I come from, known for education. How do black boys do in Tennessee? Let's go to Texas. Biggest state in the union. They got all kinds of money for education. How do black boys do in Texas? Let's go to Arizona, California, Oregon, back to Washington. We just toured the whole United States. And every school system is going to say, what about the black boys? Not doing well. And we dare to blame who? Is it possible? that all the black boys in the United States are practicing the same kind of failure within our system? Or is it not an indictment of a system that persistently and continuously fails to educate certain people, particularly poor children and minority children? If you could get that boy, this, this came to me as a teacher saying black boys don't want to learn. And you, if you didn't notice, I happen to be black. So I'm like, what is this teacher talking about? What do you mean, black boys don't want to learn? Well, they come to class, they got their pants hanging down all the time, they always got their Walkmans on, they can't hardly walk, and they don't pay attention, and they don't turn in their assignments, and they don't do this and they don't do that. I said, if you could get this kid's parents in your classroom and use the same curriculum and the same approach and the same techniques you use with their son, do you think they would pass or would they fail? Guess what the teacher said? He said they would probably fail. I said, you get his grandparents into your classroom and use the same books, the same curriculum, same approach you use with their grandson. I said, do you think they would pass or would they fail? So they would probably fail. I said, so are we looking at an issue that just showed up with a boy with baggy pants? 
Are we not looking at a long-term historical systemic failure of educational systems to effectively educate certain people? And so we really need to look critically at the system. And these children are like the canary in the mine shaft. You guys heard that analogy? The miners used to take a canary down in the mine shaft with them because the canary has a weaker respiratory system than a human being. And so when the gases would come in, guess who would die first? When the canary died, what time was it for you? Time to go. Time to run. Guess who the canaries are in our society? Poor children and minority children. And when we see them dying, it should warn us that what's wrong in the system? That there's poisons in this system. You may be strong enough to endure it, but our children are not. And so it's a warning for our society. And that goes back to the African proverb, how are the children? If the children are dying, I guarantee you society is not healthy. Uh, U.S. graduation rate, 83%, 2014-15. Washington State, 79%. In 2015, it was 78 and 76. That's progress, but probably within the margin of error in the data, to tell you the truth. So that it looks like it's progress, but they probably didn't count somebody. Gender, you got 82% for females, 76% for males, which accounts for some of the gender issues we have to recognize happens for kids as well. This increased from 80% and 72%. Race, Asian students are the best in your state, 88.6%. American Indian, 60.6%. I think they're the lowest. African American, 70.7%. White, 81.5%. Do you see why cultural match and cultural mismatch is important in a conversation like this? Who are we failing with? And who are we succeeding with? So race, color itself, there's no research that suggests that the color of a child's face determines whether they can learn, what their potential is, what their intellect is, and none of that, zero. So we use race as a crude measure to be able to identify the kids, but the real conflict is actually deeper than just skin color. And so these numbers give us a warning. Seattle Public Schools, 78%, went up one point from last year. But look at the last one. Cultural match, resources, great community, a lot of support, the best educators. Guess who goes to teach at those schools? Guess who don't want to go teach at Tuckwilla? The best teachers. And so this is a systemic problem. Next slide. This is the adjusted rate, and this includes all of the kids that we don't often see in that other data. Special education, limited English, low income, migrant, 504, homeless, foster care, female, male. Numbers significantly lower than the average that we tend to publicize. People don't want to publicize these numbers very much because it is quite a failure for these children. Next slide. Washington has one of the lowest on-time graduation rates in the U.S. And your state superintendent says one reason it's so low is that uh, money. So if you put a lot of money in a kid's pocket, they get really smart, right? Or is that resources, really? It's not money, it's resources and opportunity. And so affording that to, how many people can tell me where the best school is in your school district? Best school. What's the worst school? Everybody knows that, even our children. And so again, it's systemic. Next slide. I pulled this one out on purpose. I pulled this one out on purpose because I wanted you to look at where's the largest cohort of black kids? Are they in regular school? You got 83 kids there. That's the largest number of kids, largest cohort. Where are they? Look at their graduation rate. Is that the one you want to put in the newspaper? And why do those kids live in alternative school? 
instead of regular school. Cultural match, cultural mismatch. We don't know what to do with him. So what are we going to do with him? Send him to alternative school. He's going to do great at alternative school, right? Or we just got rid of that kid. And so these numbers, again, and go back to the process of change. We need honesty in these conversations. You can't go anywhere if you can't have a real direct and honest conversation. Next slide. This was in the newspaper and shows that the grade level gap between black kids and white kids in Seattle is number five in the whole country. Again, a systemic failure. Next slide. I pulled this because I wanted you to look at those factors and think about how does any of them have anything to do with school, teachers, administrators, or anything that's happened in that school. All of them have to do, where did the arrows point? Whose fault is it that kids drop out? Look, everybody except who? Except the system. You know, it's the parents. You know, you got a single mother at home, you know, so and so, so and so, all kinds of excuses. And this is the state level list of reasons for dropout. So, is it ever going to be accountable for what happens with teachers or administrators or the school? When I, whenever I talk with administrators about what's going on with the schools, I ask, what is their theory of change? And when I hear the answer, we're going to fix the kids, it gives me all the information I need. Yes, and so it goes back to the focus of changing the focus from the kid to the system. Next slide. Both structural and cultural barriers affect the success of African-American students in school. Neither alone is sufficiently accountable or to blame for the dismal failure of African-American students to learn. Rosa Parks. Who goes to that school? I do this with a room full of white kids. I said, who goes to this school? They don't even want to answer the question. I said, come on, tell me what you think. Well, we don't know. I says, who goes to Rosa Parks? They finally admit that they got the stereotype. They say black kids. And I make them think about, how did you get to that? They said, well, Rosa Parks was famous. She's a civil rights leader. We usually name schools after famous people. They usually name it in the neighborhood with people who look like that person. I said, that's a reasonable train of thought. I said, now, is it a good school or not a good school? What do you think? And they hesitate again. I said, come on, tell me. Is Rosa Parks, where it's located, with the people it's serving, is it a good school? They don't want to state that either, but they finally do. No, it's not a good school. And then I get to ask them, has any of you people ever been to Rosa Parks? No. So how do you know so much about Rosa Parks and you've never even been there? This is the how heavy stereotypes weigh on our schools and our kids. And the kids know it. Because I went there for a whole year, week at a time. Every week I went to that school. I asked the kids, why do you think I come up here? Because you like us. Because you want to teach us. Because you want us to learn. I said, all of that is true. But I said, do you know you got a very special school? Nobody moves. I said, somebody tell me you got a special school. One kid said they got a special school. I said, the rest of you, what do you think? Tell me, you got a special school. We got a special school. I said, everybody stand up. Tell me you got a special school. They said, we got a special school. I said, I still can't hear you. Tell me you got a special school. They said, we got a special school. I said, I still can't hear you. I had those kids yelling that they got a special school. And I would say Tuck Willa is constructed the same way as a Rosa Parks, with these people from all around the world. You think you're in the United Nations when you walk through Tuck Willa schools. Amazing, rich, rich diversity at active diversity, not the token diversity. Oh, we need a black guy. We need a Latino. Oh, we need this person. No, viable communities that are in the school together. This is what real diversity is supposed to look like, but it's seen as a threat and a liability instead of a value. And even for our children, how many of them hear negative stuff about Rosa Parks? How many Tuck Willa students hear negative stuff about Tuck Willa? I'm in the hotel where I'm staying, and they asked me what I was doing. I said, I was working with Tuck Willa. And the guy said, oh my goodness. I don't even know this man. This is the stereotype that sticks to schools and to communities. Um, <clears throat> But for sake of time, I'm going to skip those other two. Go to the next slide. The majority of teachers are generally white and middle class, and cultural norms and values of the institutional cultures are generally derived from and defined by dominant middle class cultural perspectives. 
There may be a cultural match between similarly situated students and teachers. There also may exist a cultural mismatch between poor and minority students and their teachers. Next slide. By identifying and investing specific behaviors, physical and cultural components with meaning and value, schools and institutions can create a hierarchy based on characteristics of children, their home cultures, and their communities. When a majority group assumes the power of instituting norms from which minority groups are seen as deviant, differences between these groups become institutionalized, and differences is then perceived as what? As deficit or as a failure to meet the standards of the majority. This is an incredible <clears throat> fact and statement that we need to recognize, that once somebody is relegated to other or different, they are seen as what? They're climbing up a hill. And this is structural as well. It's not one white person who did this, and not one rich person who did this, it's not one man who did this, but the society we live in, if you are different, you are seen as less than. Next slide. This is important as well. Break it down into three dimensions of culture. Instead of culture being seen as just the food, clothes, and dance, and music, and all that, which is surface culture, we have to recognize there's deeper culture at play. Dimension one is the visible, technical level observed by insiders and outsiders. This is what our society typically calls culture. Food, clothes, music, all of these things. This is surface culture. This is not deep culture. Second level of culture is the private level shared by insiders, revealed to trusted outsiders, and seen in patterns of interactions. This is how we talk to each other. This is internal. The third level is the underlying implicit level of primary culture that links and defines patterns of interconnections between and among each dimension. This is the deep culture. So when it comes to education, is there a black education versus a white education versus a Native American education versus an Asian education? Or is there education? Is there a black health care versus a white health care versus a, a Latino health care? So when we get to that deep level, that's where we're supposed to find the commonalities. And we can ask this same expectation of other people. There should be no excuses. I don't care what color your face is for failure toward our children. And every one of us, when, when we come to diversity, I always get asked to come and talk about diversity. Do they ask white people to come and talk about diversity? If a white person shows up to talk about diversity, everybody's like, what, is they, what do they know? And that's an excuse. I don't let any of my students off the hook. You are expected to be a teacher for what children in your classroom? Just the ones who look like you, walk like you, talk like you, think like you, live like you? Or who are you expected to teach? Every one of those children. And I press my students to be that kind of teacher. And a lot of them, when they leave my class, they say, Dr. Lake, I'm going to be that kind of teacher. I said, what kind of teacher? He said, I'm going to be that teacher for those kids who don't get a teacher like me. And I've had incredibly white students want to go to Rosa Parks. One of my quietest students, brilliant girl, straight A student, quiet as a mouse. Want, say, I want to go somewhere where I can engage real diversity, Dr. Lake, because there's no diversity around here. I want to go to Rosa Parks. I hear you talk about it all the time. So I arranged for her to go to Rosa Parks. She goes to Rosa Parks. First day, she called me on the phone, Dr. Lake. I don't know if I can handle this. <laughs> This is a tough school. She said, so much going on, I can't even keep up. I said, well, hang on for this week. I'm going to be up there Friday, so you just hang on. <laughs> she called me back Friday before I left going up there. She said, Dr. Lake, I changed my mind. She said, I think this is the very right school for me. She said, I am learning what I need to learn here. This is what we need to expect of each other. I don't care what color you are. You come to this conversation, you come to support our children to be excellent and successful in their education. Next slide. Cultural competence is one of those code words. It's kind of like uh, cultural responsive teaching and all of that, diversity, all of those are code words. Push past that to the question of whether you can actually teach effectively in a context, multicultural context. And it's an ongoing practice. Nobody's, how many people in here are perfectly culturally competent with every group you run into? Let me see hands. Can you be culturally competent in this room and step through the door and be culturally incompetent? Yes. So think of it as a moving target, one that you have to always stay up on. You got to always be working to maintain your competency, and it doesn't come with skin color. And you can't sit back and relax with your cultural competence because the world is moving and these kids are moving. If you're going to stay relevant, you got to. I meet with kids twice a week. I've been doing it my whole career. 
When I was in my PhD program, my advisor said most PhDs would consider you wasting your time spending it in a public school. But it is the only way my work has remained relevant is I learn from the kids and they learn from me. We have to be humble enough to listen to our kids and learn from them and then help them with the education. Next slide. Um, go four more, put, put, put everything in there. Unconsciously incompetent, consciously incompetent, consciously competent, unconsciously inco incompetent. Unconsciously incompetent means people don't even know that they are not competent. The next level up, now you know. You are consciously incompetent. Usually that's when people run, because they figure out, I can't do this. The third one, consciously competent, means you've made a hurdle across that little mark in the middle. You are competent, but you tend to go back and forth. This is why it's a moving target as well. You're going to find yourself incompetent, but what should you do? Make that leap up to try to be competent. That's that learning space, that line. And unconsciously competent, that's when you do it and you don't even know you're doing it. I think this brother right here does that. He's competent, he probably don't even think about what it means to be competent with the kids he work with because that's just him. And that's when you know your skills are really working is when you walk in the room and you don't even think about what you're doing. You don't think about it, do you? You have to make a plan before you go in. Let me see, what am I gonna do with the black kids? What am I gonna do with the, 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 the You don't have to do that. If you're competent, you go work with your kids. Next slide. Uh, cultural responsive teaching, that's one I wanted you to think about because is this for white kids? Anybody ever heard them define culturally responsive teaching for white kids? Mm -mm. It's like multicultural education. Who is that for? People say everybody, but I say when it's for everybody, they just call it education. When they call it multicultural education, who is that for? Those other people. And so we have to be conscious of what we are saying when we use it. And this applies to all children, but we tend to think of it as only applying to those different children, you know, those diverse children, those racially diverse children. Next slide. This is an important slide because it talks about how we actually change. Studies of cross-cultural experiences suggest that there's a fairly predictable pattern of adjustment when interacting with people one perceives as different from oneself. You should give that to every one of your teachers. Most individuals require a significant amount of time before they can develop the in-depth understanding that is required for them to live and work effectively and comfortably with people from other backgrounds. Some suggest that this period may be as long as what? How much cultural competence training do we give teachers? One day, and then they go back and they go back and mess up just like they did before they had the training. It takes about two years. Clearly, if acquiring a cultural identity through our primary socialization requires full immersion in a culture over a long period of time, it stands to reason that reshaping one's cultural outlook as a result of secondary socialization will also take a long amount of time. We expect teachers to come to this and give them two weeks training and they're going to come and be culturally competent. They're still scared to death. They in that space where they know they're incompetent now. They didn't know before, but you done gave them two weeks of training and you done told them how incompetent they are. And they come back to work and now they're really scared to death. <laughs> and so think about this as a process over time. And for anybody who's a learner, it should never end. And so press your teachers to remain learners, especially about those cultures different than their own. Next slide. This is a good point that actually makes people feel a little better about that interaction is mutual accommodation. It means both of us have to participate in this conversation. If you look at it, teachers in schools as well as students and families must modify behaviors and attitudes in the effort to reach what should be our common goal, academic success with cultural integrity for all of our children. Sonia Nato, great educator. All teachers and administrators need to develop skills in multicultural communication, interactions, and understanding. Next slide. All students, parents, educators, and other stakeholders must be aware of the goals and inform the strategies to support students. Ongoing review of results must inform goals and strategies employed to positively affect students. These strategies must be employed consistently at school and where? At home to positively affect all students. Next slide. And students as consultants. That's what I was just saying. Students are consultants in their own education. We should consult with young people on how the structure and culture of schools contribute to low academic achievement and enlist their input when interventions to improve student performance are being designed and implemented. 
Students can be seen as active agents in their own educations and permitted to co-construct knowledge with their teachers and others. For you children, take that serious. You are part of your own education, and we should encourage teachers to pay attention to their children as consultants. Next slide. <clears throat> This is students that I surveyed about four factors that affect their academic performance and achievement. They list race and ethnicity as the number one. They list expectations of students and teachers as number two. Diversity other than race, very low. Education and civic involvement, also very low. Next slide. Shel Silverstein, anybody heard of him? Beautiful man, has amazing stuff. This is one of my favorite little ones from him. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves. Then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Thank you.